Chapter 11 Cheat Sheet The corpse of a large, heavily built cat with a yellowish-brown leather coat and black spots lay in front of Michael. It had a gemstone embedded in its forehead, which made it easy for Michael to recall what type of monster it was. A fully matured gem jaguar? That's a low tier one monster. Michael mumbled to himself. He turned to Fenrir and asked aloud, Did you see many gem jaguars in the surrounding forest? Several deep gashes were spread across the gem jaguar's body, which made it clear that even a heroic summon such as Fenrir was not able to kill the tier one monster in a single strike. Michael hadn't expected something like that in the first place, but he got a bad feeling. Fenrir hadn't been out for long, but he had already found and killed a tier one monster. That could mean Fenrir was lucky and skilled, or it could mean something extremely bad. The entire forest is filled with tier one monsters. Gem jaguars are only one of the many kinds of monsters I encountered while pacing alongside the protection barrier. Fenrir informed him. He was not injured and hadn't used a lot of energy to kill the gem jaguar since he made use of the territory's protection barrier. The entire forest is filled with tier one monsters? Michael wondered before he spoke his concern out loud. You mean the gem jaguar is one of the weakest monsters you encountered? There are no tierless monsters in this area? This is the weakest monster, Fenrir affirmed calmly, pointing at the low tier one gem jaguar. The power threshold of all beings was not only divided into tiers, but was further classified to fit the refinement degree of a tier. This was usually done in four ways, using the terms low, mid, high, peak. Some races used different terms, but it was all the same in the end. Looking at Fenrir should have calmed Michael as well, but the heroic summon's calm attitude was more unnerving than calming to the heart. Tier 1 Monster Is that why I received a sudden burst of energy from Fenrir's link of loyalty? Since Michael had never wielded the energy of the Origin Expanse, he didn't know what he was supposed to feel. He was also not sure how his war rune would react upon getting refined, but from the looks of it, neither was anything special. The refinement of the war rune tingled a little bit, and the energy influx spreading through the link of loyalty was barely perceptible. How the hell is that important now? He shouted at himself in his head. Michael had just found out a shocking fact. Tier 1 monsters surrounded his territory. How could he think about anything else? Usually, a lord started in a region that was mostly inhabited by tierless monsters. In rare cases, there would be tier 1 monsters in the beginner area of newly appointed lords. Even then, the tier 1 monsters were rather peaceful in most cases. Unfortunately, it looked like Michael's bad luck struck him fiercely in the gut once again. Would Fenrir be able to kill the gem jaguar without the protection barrier? No, even if he is a heroic summon, he is still tierless. Michael figured, his expression turning sour. Without the protection barrier, his territory would have already been bulldozed by now. That was the most important piece of information he gauged from Fenrir's first hunt, and it was certainly not pleasant. In ten days, he would be dead, and his territory would get raised if he didn't do something to prevent it. I need to do something. If I leave the fate of my territory hanging like this, it's only a matter of time before my journey ends miserably, before it even started. Leaving everything to Fenrir didn't feel right either. However, Michael didn't want to expose Tigerfang. Not right now. It was as if something was holding him back from retrieving Tigerfang from the war rune. Though, he was not sure why. He was relieved that he had brought a hidden artifact from home and that nobody knew about it. Why am I relieved about that? Shouldn't I expose it and help Fenrir go hunt? That way, both of us can increase the refinement deg. Reev, or am I worried about facing a tier 1 monster even though I'm still tierless? That's probably it. While Michael was deep in thought while keeping his eyes trained on the gem jaguar, Tiara smiled brightly. She bent down to take a closer look at the gem jaguar and diverted her focus to Fenrir a moment later. Please help me dissect the gem jaguar, Fenrir. Tiara requested, pointing at Fenrir's spear. They didn't have another weapon. After all, Michael continued to keep Tigerfang hidden, even if their situation demanded every bit of help they could receive. Fenrir froze upon hearing Tiara's request. His eyes turned into slits and he kept staring at Tiara for several seconds. 
Tiara was surprised about the sudden change in Fenrir's behavior, but it was nothing too surprising. A true warrior would never accept being unarmed. The spear could be considered Fenrir's final lifeline, and he wouldn't hand it over. Without a fight. My soul trait should be better than using Fenrir's spear. I can extract everything neatly using extraction. Michael intervened before the situation worsened. He was not sure where the tension between Tiara and Fenrir came from because he had been deep in thought, but he didn't want the only two subjects in his territories to fight. Michael squatted down next to Tiara, his eyes focused on the dead body. He stared blankly at the gem jaguar for a while as shudders spread through his entire body. It was the first time he saw a monster corpse up close. There was a lot of blood and everything felt so different compared to the fights against the Amactels in the final examination. The Amactels were recreated from reality, but they were just illusions at the end of the day. It was different compared to the monster corpse, which didn't turn into countless particles upon getting killed. You are a lord now. You need to be strong, a role model, a true leader. Get your act together, you fool, he reprimanded himself. A moment later, he extended his hands and came to halt a few centimeters above the corpse. Several streaks of golden light conjured within his palms. The streaks of golden light reached out to the corpse, and they got to work. The gemstone embedded in the forehead of the monster detached itself, and it reappeared in front of Michael, completely unscathed and intact. There was not a single scratch on the tennis ball-sized gemstone. However, that was not everything. A black ball with bluish glowing streaks of light spreading through it materialized next to the gemstone. It was of a matching size and was a monster core. Every monster had a monster core. The energy of the origin was hoarded and stored in the monster core, refining it. In return, the monster core refined the body and mind of the monster. It was similar to the war rune in that aspect. An undamaged tier 1 monster core of low quality and a tier 1 gemstone. Looks like I'm quite lucky, Michael thought, uncertain of what price both materials could fetch him. Artificers used monster cores and gemstones as materials to craft artifacts. Thus, they would certainly have some value, though Michael was not too familiar with the price range of most items. But there were still more precious materials and items inside the gem jaguar. Michael's energy was quickly drained, but he continued to use extraction to search through the corpse for precious resources. And as if on cue, leather parchments materialized in front of him. There was a total of four leather parchments, and they looked like someone had custom designed them for him. Each leather parchment was roughly the same size, perfectly fitting in his palm. What is that? Oh! Michael exclaimed. He held the parchments high in the air and began to smile brightly when a flash of information entered his mind. Fragments of a summoning scroll. Michael knew that some monsters in the origin expanse had a low chance of dropping loot, such as summoning scrolls, construction blueprints, unique crafting materials, and even artifacts. The drop rate was extremely low, but it was still L-existent. However, Michael never heard that it was possible for fragments of a summoning scroll to drop. The drop rate of unique loot was higher the stronger and more unique a monster. Nonetheless, Michael didn't expect much. The drop rates were simply too low. But extraction changed everything. His soul trait could extract everything. This was something Michael had already figured out by digesting most of the information he received upon awakening extraction. However, what he found out only now was that extracting everything was much more than what was visible to his eyes. Extraction was only a two-star soul trait, but if it was truly possible to increase the drop rate of items unique to the origin expanse, wasn't that comparable to possessing a cheat sheet? Michael's hair stood up on its end, and excitement spread through his entire being. What else can I extract, other than summoning scroll fragments? Where is the limit? Is there even a limit in the first place? He chuckled as he kept extraction fully unleashed on the corpse of the gem jaguar. To think that I would get excited after spawning in a tier one territory full of ferocious beasts that can tear me apart with a single slash, I am utterly insane. Chapter 12, Perfect Extraction. The origin expanse was mysterious and unique. Nobody really knew where it came from and the reason it existed in the first place. 
Too many aspects of the Origin Expanse felt like a game of conquest, which included the unique loot one could obtain from killing monsters. Everyone entering the Origin Expanse received a territory with unique buildings, a maid, and a few more items to reassure that everyone had a similar starting point. Why? What was the intention of the Origin Expanse's will and its creator with a game-like realm such as the Origin Expanse? Many theories existed, but only a few were popular. The most popular was that the creator of the Origin Expanse was an omnipotent being that had grown bored and tired of the universe. In this theory, the Origin Expanse had been built for his amusement as he watched all races of the universe fight each other in a struggle to acquire more power, expand their territories, and claim resources for themselves to grow. Considering the Origin Expanse as a starting point, even life across the entire universe grew more interesting. After all, more races easily acquired technology that would have otherwise taken them thousands of years of research to come up with. This didn't even include the power countless races acquired by absorbing the dormant energy of the Origin Expanse. Of course, there were many other theories revolving around the mystery of the Origin Expanse creation, but nobody could tell right from wrong. That was why they were only theories and not facts. But even if the creator of the Origin Expanse had an evil plan in mind, did it really matter? The Origin Expanse was plundered every single day. Everyone tried to enhance their War Runes tier, whether it was to expand their lifespan or to be able to fight against others outside the Origin Expanse, whether it was for protection or conquest. The resources, technology, and artifacts procured in the Origin Expanse were extremely valuable, speeding up a race's progress by millennia in a fraction of that time. And then there were also soul traits every being could awaken only in the Origin Expanse. It was of immense value, which nobody would want to miss. Michael was no different. He had also entered the Origin Expanse to become stronger and claim his own fortune. Of course, he had other goals as well, but Michael wished to repay his brother for everything he had done for him and to make sure that entitled brats, such as his former classmates, wouldn't be able to look down on him anymore. Acquiring the status of a lord was the basic requirement to change his life. However, only by becoming a powerful lord was it possible to make sure that nobody would bother him in a society that was led on with the thought that the strong reigned supreme. But for now, Michael had to suck it up. After using his soul trait for two minutes straight, he was exhausted. His shirt clung to his body as cold sweat trickled down his temples. I am really weak, Michael grumbled to himself, but he was not completely dissatisfied with himself. A faint smile formed on his lips as he wiped the sweat off his forehead. He felt quite pleased with himself upon seeing the neatly extracted, intact body parts of the gem jaguar spread out in front of him. Michael was not yet done with the extraction, however. One or two more uses of his soul trait were enough to finish up. By then, his proficiency in using extraction would improve, speeding up the entire extraction process a little. When I get back home, I should look out for an energy circulation technique. Michael made a mental note of an important task. Now that he knew what the Origin Expanse's energy felt like, he had to reconsider using a technique to improve his proficiency while wielding it. This would improve the refinement process of his war rune as well. If you have more energy left, can you hunt a few more monsters? If possible, a few more gem jaguars. I want to check something, Michael asked Fenrir, who had been silently watching him use extraction. Fenrir gave him a slight nod and turned around to go hunt once his curiosity was satiated. Are all heroic summons that rude, master? Tiara asked, frowning deeply, while squatting down next to him. As she looked at the extracted tendons, clean and intact bones along with the meat Michael had extracted from the gem jaguar, her hands began to itch to also do something for her master and prove her worth. However, she had yet to receive an order from her master. I don't know, maybe? Michael responded, not really minding Fenrir's attitude. He understood that Fenrir would need some time to accept him as his lord and master. He pointed at the gem jaguar's tendons and leather. I will continue to extract organs and whatever else I can from the corpse. How about you make some leather flasks in the meantime? Gem jaguars didn't have a coat of fur, but their body was covered in thick, leather-like skin. 
This was also why gem jaguars were sometimes labeled as tenacious hunters that were hard to kill. Michael was a little tired, but he got up from the ground, nonetheless. He walked over to a nearby tree and a golden light conjured in his palm. A small splinter of wood formed in his palm, which he handed to Tiara. The splinter was extracted from the inner core of the rainforest tree's wood, making it more durable than ordinary needles. Tiara's tail wagged from left to right upon seeing what her master was capable of, and she nodded her head eagerly. Leave it to me. I can make hundreds of leather flasks. She exclaimed while reaching out for the extracted tendons and the bits of leather Michael had extracted for now. A few are enough. Michael mumbled before he sat down to take a few deep breaths. It was still early in the morning, but Michael was already dead tired. Using his soul trait even before getting to know what origin energy felt like was probably not the most intelligent act. Unfortunately, it was not as if he had enough time to spare. There was no time to slack off. After a short break, Michael returned to the gem jaguar's corpse. He used extraction two more times on it before he was finally done. Thanks to his soul trait, the entire process was neatly completed, and the result was near perfect. Every part of the gem jaguar's body had been extracted cleanly and was intact. Thus, he could use certain body parts such as leather and tendons without a need to worry about hygiene. The tendons were clean, and so was the leather. Not a single speck of blood or flesh was left on them after Michael cleanly dissected the gem jaguar's corpse using extraction. Once the flasks are created, I can extract and store monster blood much more easily. The blood of rare Tier 1 monsters should be worth something, Michael thought, finding multiple ways to earn money using the gem jaguar's remnants. The leather flasks were also useful for filling water extracted from branches that retained moisture. The dried branches could then be used as firewood, which would solve the remaining problem. What to do with the high-quality meat of the gem jaguar? Using his soul trait extensively consumed way too much energy. Thus, consuming the meat of a Tier 1 monster should be more than enough to replenish his energy. As a tearless lord who had yet to refine his war rune, Michael's body was not able to store a high amount of energy. Thus, he would certainly be filled to the brim after consuming a small portion of the gem jaguar's meat. With that in mind, he got back to work. He left the clearing, picked up a few wooden branches and a handful of leaves before he returned. For starters, Michael used the gem jaguar's bones to construct a ring to restrain the campfire he was about to start. He extracted the moisture within the leaves and wood with his soul trait and began to set up the campfire. Then, using a rather primitive method of fire making, Michael spent the next five minutes creating a fire. Making fire by rubbing sticks together was rather primitive and it required both practice and patience, but it worked perfectly fine. Nobody who entered the origin expanse for the first time could bring a flintstone or matches, so everyone in school had been taught how to make fire using dry wood. It was one of the things every student learned in the survival classes. Now that the fire had been ignited, Michael wanted to cook the meat and grill it on a stick. However, before he could do anything, the war rune on the back of his right hand began to glow faintly. A surge of energy spread through Fenrir's link of loyalty, filling his war rune with energy. The surge of energy was warm and soothing. It refined the war rune naturally, enhancing his strength a little. But that was not what Michael paid attention to. The storage space expanded. Michael could tell that the storage space of the war rune had expanded. It was not big by any means, but it was better than nothing. He had heard that most lords required several days until their war rune absorbed enough energy to expand their storage space. However, those lords hadn't spawned amidst a rainforest full of Tier 1 monsters. They wouldn't even encounter a Tier 1 monster in the first month, forget about being able to kill such a fierce monster. Fortunately, Michael had someone capable of doing exactly that, killing a Tier 1 monster. Fenrir barged through the rainforest's thicket and entered the clearing, pulling the second low-tier one gem jaguar behind him. The silver spear he carried in his left hand was covered in blood, while the corpse in his right hand left a trail of blood behind him. I got another one. Michael's eyes lit up and he jumped up from the ground upon hearing Fenrir's voice. Right, 
I have Fenrir, he recalled, and his expression turned brighter upon glancing at the golden light that conjured in his palms. Who the hell says that our family is unlucky? Those idiots have no idea. How about I turn misfortune into an opportunity? Chapter 13 Grinding Michael, Tiara, and Fenrir only stopped working when it was time to eat. They had to replenish their energy, and eating delicious chunks of Tier 1 monster meat was the perfect solution. The meat was rich in nutrition and was also highly invigorating. It was tasty as well. Other than savoring the meat, they grilled and ate, the three worked relentlessly until late at night. If not for the seemingly infinite darkness that spread across the dense rainforest at night, Michael and the others might have continued burning the midnight oil. Working in darkness was not possible given the lack of light sources. Furthermore, everyone was tired after working for half the day. Fenrir kept on hunting until it was too dark. He killed a total of 17 low-tier-1 monsters with the use of the protection barrier, and he reached the low refinement degree of Tier-0 through the energy share of the killed monsters. Without Fenrir, everything would have been for naught. He could hunt monsters of a higher tier thanks to his exceptional display of combat experience, spatial awareness, and reflexes. His strength couldn't be underestimated just because he made use of the territory's protection barrier. It was not easy to injure monsters of a higher tier, no matter how easy Fenrir made it seem. Meanwhile, Michael used extraction on the monster corpses to dissect them neatly. He removed their monster cores and their most valuable parts at first. Afterward, Michael focused his attention on the monster's blood. He extracted their blood twice to filter out impurities. This left him with the most potent blood, which was stored in the leather flasks Tiara had prepared beforehand. The leather flasks were marked to make sure that everyone knew which monster the blood belonged to before it was safely stored in Tiara's war rune. Her war rune's storage was much bigger than Michael's, but that was only given. After all, Tiara's war rune was already at the first tier. When Michael found out about this first, he was confused. It was already very uncommon for a lord's personal maid to be from a different race, let alone be in possession of a war rune. However, Tiara was also not that weak. Michael just thought that she wasn't that powerful at first because she didn't really show what she was capable of. That changed over the course of the day. Talking to Tiara for hours and observing her meticulous work made it clear that she had dexterous hands and that she knew what she was doing. Her huge storage space came in handy as well. A war rune storage space preserved ingredients, which would go bad if left as it is for days. With that basic understanding of the war rune, Tiara gladly accepted turning into a living fridge. The extracted meat, organs, and blood were kept inside her war rune, making sure that nothing would go bad. They didn't want to waste any ingredients because they could be of future use or sold outside the origin expanse. Michael wanted to use his soul trait as often as possible. It was currently the only way for him to get a better feeling of the energy in the origin expanse and to increase his mastery of the soul trait's utility. He worked meticulously and didn't throw anything away. His life as Lord had just begun, and it was necessary to gather as many items as possible to fund his future expenses. However, that was something for later. Now, he and his subjects deserved to get some rest. So, they all returned to the manor. Everyone had an assigned room in the wooden manor. There was little to no furniture, but there were beds, and that was enough. After a tiring but fruitful day, Michael got in bed and accessed the storage space inside the war room. Three ordinary summoning scrolls, 108 summoning scroll fragments, and a blueprint for a treehouse complex were stored inside. While he retrieved a handful of summoning scroll fragments multiple times, a faint glow engulfed them. The glow intensified the more fragments he retrieved. At last, once 25 summoning scroll fragments had been retrieved, they began to hover in the air. The fragments swirled around one another and connected to one another, merging into one. Slowly the glow dimmed, and a newly formed summoning scroll ended up falling into Michael's hands. 25 fragments form a complete summoning scroll? That's great! Michael thought excitedly before he repeated the same mythical process three more times. He was now in possession of seven ordinary summoning scrolls and one blueprint. 
Even if Fenrir killed monsters a tier above his rank, being able to extract this kind of loot from less than 20 monsters was simply insane. His soul trait, extraction, was truly something that couldn't be put on the same level as other two-star soul traits. Michael would never exchange it for a four-star soul trait, even if he was given the opportunity. He was dead tired while lying in the comfortable bed and was ready to sleep. However, the thoughts flashing through his mind prevented him from falling asleep. Today was really interesting. Who would have thought that I would end up in a rainforest surrounded by Tier 1 monsters? Well, I was able to handle the situation pretty well thanks to the heroic summon. Fenrir is a little unfriendly, and I cannot really see him warming up to me even in the future, but it should be fine. It has to be. Fenrir, I wonder where he comes from. Why does his name seem so familiar? Cleave Fenrir. Michael spent some time pondering over Fenrir. His eyelids got heavier by the second, and he could barely keep himself out of the dreamland. Which family has black hair and black eyes? Athletic but not bulky. Spear arts. Cleave. Unable to keep his eyes open, Michael finally fell asleep. The physical work he had done throughout the day was not that tiresome. However, repetitively unleashing his soul trait in its full power, over and over again, drained him both physically and mentally. He deserved some sleep, at least until the sun rose again, and the second day of his life as a lord would officially begin. While he was deep asleep, Michael was pulled back into a familiar scene. He had just seen it the day before, but he found himself watching a chaotic battlefield yet again. Tightly clutching the blood-soaked spear and clad in black leather armor that had been torn to shreds, a man stood facing his opponents with a sly smile. His jet-black hair was disheveled, and his body was bruised and battered. However, he paid no heed to the wounds and instead let his gaze roam over the vast expanse. His vibrant eyes and his fierce gaze observed the enemies that surrounded him from all sides. There was no way out. The man knew that he would die here. But even in the face of imminent death, his expression did not falter. It was filled with mockery, and he was staring right at Michael. It was then that an illusionary, semi-transparent image of a familiar, grim-looking man appeared next to the man. Both of them wore different armor and wielded different-looking spears, but their eyes and hair were the same. Even their expression was the same. The illusionary image and the man slowly merged, fusing into one. They were now one and the same persona. Isn't that... Michael thought before the space around him twisted once again. He was pulled out of the dream and woke up, gasping in shock. It was already early in the morning and the first rays of sunlight shone on his face through the open window. His second day as Lord had just begun officially, but Michael couldn't think about that, at all. He was sweating profusely and his clothes clung to his body. Instinctively, he looked down at his chest to make sure that there was no gaping hole. It was a dream, right? He looked down at his chest out of reflex and tried to calm himself by taking a deep breath. However, the image of Fenrir and the man, whom Michael recalled as the Fang family's first ancestor, fusing without causing the slightest change, left him shell-shocked. Oh, fuck. Chapter 14, The First Ancestor That's impossible, right? Michael paced from one side of the room to the other nervously. His eyes were bloodshot, his hair disheveled, and it was hard to determine whether Michael was still sane or if he had lost it. His mind kept replaying the dream in vivid clarity, recalling every single moment of the dream he had. The visuals of both Cleve Fenrir and the first ancestor of the Fang family never left his mind. They looked exactly the same. No matter how hard I try to find differences, they're definitely the same person. Michael felt like he was going insane. Wasn't the origin expanse going overboard by giving him a heroic summon that turns out to be a piece of shit? Nobody knew the Fang family's first ancestor better than Michael. He could recite every single line written in the old tattered book word by word as he had read it more than ten times. Michael liked realistic stories better than the fairy tales most parents told their children about the origin expanse. From a young age, Michael knew that the origin expanse was both a treasure trove and a graveyard. It was possible to become rich overnight, but it was also possible to die from one moment to another. The realistic tale, written in the legend of the Calamity, showed his first ancestor's life. 
It was clearly a tragic life led by his ancestor that was filled with betrayals, witnessing the deaths of loved ones, and being the center of attention while being surrounded by kingdoms and empires. Unfortunately, the first ancestor never attempted to stay on the right track. He fell into depravity and was corrupted by the power he gained inside the Origin Expanse. The first ancestor died in the Origin Expanse at last. This was exactly what led to the current situation. Michael figured that his family's miserable luck was at fault. Their miserable luck led to the summoning of a heroic summon. Their family's first ancestor, a real piece of work, and someone who was known for slaughtering his own people and trusted allies. After living through various ordeals, the first ancestor was given the name the Calamity, because he caused chaos and terror wherever he went. Does he remember everything about his past, or are his memories sealed? Michael wondered, and he stopped in his tracks. Fenrir didn't act high and mighty like the first ancestor. That could either mean Fenrir's acting skills were extraordinary, or that Fenrir didn't remember anything about his past life. What was it again? Most summoned subjects recall their lives, but not everything. The quantity and quality of memories, combined with the achievement of their past life and the innate potential of a summon, can be deduced from their star rating. Does that mean he knows everything? Michael clearly recalled the achievements of the Calamity. He also knew that the Calamity had awoken an eight-star soul trait. Combining those two factors meant that it shouldn't be possible for Fenrir to be a heroic summon. He should be an eight-star summon, given his achievements and innate talent, Michael thought. The more he thought about it, the more confused he grew. A bad headache crept up his brain, and he felt like pulling his hair. As long as Fenrir didn't recall his past life as the Calamity, everything would be fine. However, if he recalled his bad deeds or some of the emotions of his past life, the Origin Expanse would have to face the second coming of the Calamity. How can I find out whether he has retained his past life's memories or emotions without attracting any suspicion? Provoking him would work, but I would die, that's for sure. Michael ruffled through his hair, pulling out some strands in the process. Isn't there an easier way? He heard footsteps below him, too many for a single person to make at a time. That only meant both Tiara and Fenrir must have woken up. Hearing their footsteps caused Michael's heart to beat wildly. I cannot leave Tiara alone with that guy, he thought worriedly. A moment later, he walked out of the bedroom. Think, Michael, there, he has to be an easier way to secretly find out if Fenrir is this piece of shit, or if he is still the innocent kid from the start of the story. Think. Michael walked through the hallway on the second floor. He made his way to the staircase to meet up with the others, while his mind seemed to be on fire trying to come up with a solution. Michael didn't even question anymore whether Fenrir was his family's first ancestor. It was not logical, but the Origin Expanse seemed to love bullying his family. But that did not change the fact that Fenrir looked like the first ancestor, wielded a spear, and he was a heroic summon. Michael also recalled the time a faint gust of wind brushed past Fenrir's face when Fenrir left the clearing to hunt the first monster. The gust had revealed a mole behind his ear. It was shaped weirdly, as if it was a mark. Now that he thought about it, Michael recalled that his brother had teased him about the same mark in the past. Danny didn't have this mole, but he said that some members of the Fang family would have this mole behind their right ear. That was enough to be certain that Fenrir was indeed their first ancestor, leaving only the question of his past memories and emotions. His spe- Michael exclaimed, just to shut his mouth and cover it with both hands. His spear art. The Calamity's spear art was not mentioned often in the tattered book, nor was it detailed, but it was usually described as a vile or wicked spear art. Only once was it further described as a vile technique that uses the wielder's true feelings and intrusive thoughts as its foundation. The higher the mastery of the spear art, the more challenging it was to ignore their intrusive thoughts and hide how they truly felt. Recalling what was written in the tattered book, a vibrant smile formed on his lips. Michael found out what he had been looking for. If Fenrir could use the wicked spear arts, that means he recalled his life as calamity 
and that he was merely playing dumb in front of both him and Tiara to gather strength and wait for the best opportunity to strike. Even if he wouldn't remember his life as Calamity, practicing the wicked spear arts meant that Fenrir would turn evil sooner or later. Fenrir was still weak and required the territory's protection barrier to hunt Tier 1 monsters easily. With the Lord's death, the protection barrier would disappear as well. Fenrir should have figured that Tiara was a Tier 1 maid as well. Attacking Michael while Tiara stayed by his side was not feasible for him, yet. I hope you're not using the vile spear arts, otherwise. Michael thought with determination. Blood will be shed inside the protection barrier. He reached the final step of the staircase and emerged on the ground floor. It was only his second day in the Origin Expanse, but Michael could tell that blood and chaos would be served today. Master, how was your first night in the Origin Expanse? Did you sleep well? Chapter 15 Spear Arts Master, how was your first night? Did you sleep well? Tiara asked, looking with concern at Michael. Now that Michael was aware of Fenrir's true identity, the gazes lingering on him felt like searing hot needles piercing his skin. Tiara might be acting just like before, being excited and happy that Michael didn't depart to the outside worlds yet, but Fenrir was clearly sizing him up from head to toe. Maybe that had happened already the day before, and Michael didn't notice it. Either way, he was now fully aware of every movement made by Fenrir. I was too, excited to sleep. I must look like a big mess right now, Michael answered with a faint smile on his lips. He changed his answer midway upon realizing the piercing gaze with which Fenrir kept staring at him from the side. Michael noticed this, and it made him feel as if something was pressing against his throat. It was hard to breathe, and he broke into a sweat. You're sweating so much. Please don't be so stressed out about our predicament, Tiara voiced out in worry. If you don't sleep enough, you will get sick. We need you full of energy. Tiara's fluffy ears hung down limply, and her tail was also not swishing like usual. She looked down as well with a gloomy expression plastered on her face. What is wrong with this girl? Michael wondered, but his forced smile was soon replaced by a genuine one. Seeing that someone cared about his well-being was quite nice, and the real reason why she was so worried didn't really matter. He took a step closer to Tiara and flicked her forehead lightly, forcing the maid of the Silverfang Tigerfolk to look up. Upon seeing his smile, Tiara relaxed a little. She lightly patted her chest to calm down her heart, and retrieved something from her war rune. The summoning gate produced one scroll this morning, she said, holding out an ordinary summoning scroll. Another perk of being a lord was that they would get summoning scrolls just by staying idle and letting the days pass. The summoning gate would produce one ordinary summoning scroll each day. Most subjects summoned through ordinary summoning scrolls would be starless or one-star summons, but that was still something. Slowly but steadily, and a small workforce would come into existence. How about we use all summoning scrolls today? It's still early in the morning, so we will get lots of work done with a few more helping hands. Tiara proposed, rubbing her hands in excitement. It was only obvious to focus on increasing their numbers and use the additional working force to build a few residences, help Fenrir in hunting, and so on. However, Michael didn't want to summon any subjects right now. Why? There was a potential crazy serial killer in his territory. Was there really a need to come up with more excuses? Michael was already feeling bad for dragging Tiara into the mess. However, it was not as if he could send her away. She would just die outside the territory, since there were way too many powerful monsters outside the safety of his protection barrier. I will postpone summoning subjects until the afternoon, or tomorrow morning. There are a few things I must test out, and I don't want to rush things, Michael said as calmly as possible, trying to make it sound as if he had a strong plan and his schedule mapped out for the entire day. He had a total of eight ordinary summoning scrolls. With that many additional helping hands, they would be able to build a few residences and create a more efficient hunting system. Slow and steady wins the race. Michael added while stealing glances at Fenrir every now and then, and I want to win by all means. He knew that he shouldn't look at Fenrir so much because Fenrir might notice that something was amiss, but Michael couldn't help it. 
He was also afraid that he would have a slip of tongue, but that didn't happen, fortunately. You look tired, Fenrir. Will you be fine going out hunting the entire day just like yesterday? Michael asked, trying his best to act as if he was concerned. But secretly Mika, El was glad that Fenrir's eyes were sunken and bloodshot. His hair was disheveled, and there were bags under his eyes, making them look puffed. Fenrir clearly hadn't gotten any sleep, which was something that could be made use of. I will be fine. I prefer hunting all day, Fenrir answered before excusing himself. He seemed eager to leave the wooden manor and go out hunting. Are you sure that you don't want to eat anything for breakfast, Fenrir? You will run out of energy until lunchtime. Tiara asked in a loud voice, but Fenrir had already stepped outside the wooden manor. Did he ignore me? Or did he not hear me? Tiara mumbled upon seeing that Fenrir didn't turn around either. However, she didn't really mind it. Tiara was so happy that her lord didn't leave her to go back to the outside world, so nothing could dampen her spirits this morning. What do you want to test out that other subjects are not supposed to see, Master? She asked while turning to Michael with gleaming eyes. Tiara figured that there had to be a secret nobody was supposed to know. Otherwise, her lord wouldn't postpone summoning more subjects. She could tell that her lord was not dumb, which meant that there was something he was hiding. Due to this, her curiosity increased even more. I can tell you later, probably. Michael responded before he had a light breakfast, which consisted of meat and more meat. They had yet to harvest fruits and other ingredients from the forest. Thus, their meals would have only meat for a while, but that was no problem. Fenrir's link of loyalty didn't change at all, Michael noticed while he had breakfast. Tiara's link of loyalty was a little different compared to the day before, but Fenrir's was the same. He tried to keep calm and not act too weird, but he was not sure how he was supposed to do that. Calm down and get your plan working. Michael wanted to find out whether Fenrir was using the wicked spear arts to kill his prey, but he didn't rush after him right away. Fenrir didn't seem to have slept, and he had skipped breakfast as well. Thus, it was better to wait a little longer to make sure that Fenrir would be a little bit more tired. Exhaustion and lack of sleep would make him lower his guard, and that way it would be easy for Michael to enact his plan. I will extract sturdy wood and stones from the trees and ground. You can either store them in your war rune or put them in one of the empty rooms inside the wooden manor, Michael proposed before he got to work. In the next few hours, nothing seemed different from the day before. Fenrir used the protection barrier to hunt monsters before he collected their corpses to carry it inside the clearing, where Michael would use his soul trait to dissect the body near perfectly. Nothing seemed amiss until it was about time to have lunch. Fenrir had killed a total of ten low tier one monsters, which rewarded one completed summoning scroll and fifty-nine summoning scroll fragments. Meanwhile, Tiara and Michael focused on collecting resources from their surroundings. Tiara was not sure what or why Michael was running around inside his territory, collecting resources with his soul trait when he could also summon subjects to harvest. However, she remained silent. It was not her task to teach her master, but to follow his commands. When she finished preparing lunch and was about to serve it, Michael suddenly announced that he would go and call Fenrir. He left the clearing in the direction Fenrir had gone toward a while ago, leaving Tiara by herself. Is that really fine? Isn't Master too bubbly and kind to be a lord? She mumbled to herself while observing the retreating figure of her master. Tiara liked people like Michael because they were true to themselves and others. Unfortunately, some would think of Michael as a pushover. It was highly likely that others would try to make use of her master for their personal gains. Tiara understood this very well. Shaking her head, she tried to ignore the memories of the past that resurfaced in her mind, and a glint manifested in her eyes. In that case, I will make sure that Master will be fine, only then he might be able to. She trailed off and went back to work. Meanwhile, Michael paved his way through the densely grown rainforest. Only a small part of the rainforest was inside the protection barrier, but it still took a while before he reached the barrier. As he neared it, he could hear the faint and distant sound of fighting. By the time he made his way through the thicket, 
Michael was only able to witness the end of the battle. Fenrir had used the protection barrier to fight two low tier one monsters, a pair of gem jaguars. One of them was already lying on the ground, taking its last breath, while the other one was severely injured. The gem jaguar tried to break through the protection barrier to reach Fenrir, whose silver spear was shrouded in a dark purple hue. His lips curled up in a smirk as he dashed ahead. Fenrir thrust the silver spear forward, aiming straight at the beast. It was a simple attack without any unnecessary grace or elegance. However, that was not needed in the first place. The blade pierced through the gem jaguar's throat, ending the monster's life in seconds. Wow! Michael could only think in awe. His heart skipped a beat upon seeing the display of Fenrir's spear art, and a vibrant smile appeared on his face as he cleared his throat. Fenrir turned around in shock, ready to face his next opponent, only to see that Michael was waving at him with a vibrant smile plastered on his face. Nice kill, Fenrir. Lunch is ready. When Fenrir realized that the territory's lord had approached him and not some monster, he relaxed visibly. Michael was just a bubbly kid who became lord because everyone in the Origin Expanse started out as a lord. He was not dangerous. He didn't even have a weapon to begin with. Thus, Fenrir put the spear aside and pulled the two corpses inside the protection barrier. He saw Michael approaching but didn't pay any attention. Let me carry one of them, Michael offered, still smiling as brightly as before. His acting skill was top-notch. Not even he himself would be able to tell that his mind was in chaos if he were to observe himself as an outsider. The Spear Arts, It's the Calamities. Chapter 16, Bloody Lunch. The moment Michael saw the dark purple hue shrouding Fenrir's silver spear, he knew that it was over. Fenrir might not recall all of his memories, but the fact that he used the wicked spear arts turned him into a much bigger problem than the monsters outside the protection barrier could be poor. As long as Fenrir was given enough time to grow stronger, nobody inside his territory would be able to handle the seven-star summon. Michael was trying to come up with a foolproof way to solve the entire mess, now that he had found out that the worst-case scenario came true, but that was easier said than done. He was trying hard to chat lightly with Fenrir. Fortunately, Fenrir was not talkative. After a few attempts to strike up a conversation, Michael gave up. He was more likely to mess up and make some mistakes because his nerves were preventing him from thinking straight. Either way, both Fenrir and Michael carried one of the gem jaguar corpses each to the clearing. Tiara saw them and waved excitedly. She was a little surprised to see that there were two corpses, but didn't think too much about it. It was only obvious that Fenrir would become stronger the more monsters he killed. The energy influx he received from killing a tier 1 monster was not little, and he was a 7-star summon. His basic combat prowess was already terrifyingly high in the first place. After adding the physical enhancement he received for every monster he killed, it was only a matter of time before he could leave the protection barrier to go out and hunt. This is good news, Tiara thought. Lunch is ready. Take as much as you want, master, she told Michael before turning to Fenrir. Don't hesitate to eat your fill. You need to keep your energy level up, otherwise, you may end up exhausted and make a big mistake. You didn't even have breakfast this morning. Tiara lectured Fenrir, but he simply ignored her. He sat down on a small wooden stool, which Michael had created by experimenting a lot with his new soul trait, and put the spear aside. His stomach rumbled, and Fenrir felt like he could eat a whole pig. He hadn't expected to encounter so many monsters this morning, and regretted not having had a full breakfast. Tiara frowned upon noticing that Fenrir ignored her once again. She looked helplessly over to Michael, who kept smiling. The day before, Michael was like a starving wolf, gobbling the food she had prepared for them. However, today, he seemed a little different. He didn't even eat a lot this morning. Wasn't he a glutton? Was she mistaken? After thinking about it for a few seconds, Tiara gave it a shrug. She concluded that maybe pondering a lot over the progress of the territory caused him not to feel too hungry. Fenrir picked up one of the thick sticks Tiara had used to grill the meat above the campfire. He took a bite of the juicy grilled meat, and it was as if his taste buds exploded. Was it possible for Tier 1 meat to taste that good? Fenrir doubted his taste buds, 
but he devoured the meat sticking to the spear, ensuring he did not leave even a tiny bit. Still nibbling on the remnants of meat hanging on the wooden handle, Fenrir picked up a second one. Oh, this is much better than I exp, he said looking at Tiara while continuing to eat. However, before he could finish his sentence, a bright light shone upon him as if something was glinting brightly in the sun on his left. At first, Fenrir didn't think too much about it because Michael was sitting to his left. Michael didn't have a reason to attack his own subject, forget about his only heroic summon, whom he needed desperately, to begin with. Furthermore, this pushover of a lord was not even in possession of a weapon. There was no way that the bubbly kind pushover could do something to him. But that was a gross underestimation, something Fenrir realized way too late when a nagging thought popped up in his mind. What item in Michael's possession could reflect sunlight? There shouldn't be anything like that, right? He wondered. When his head turned, oh the left, Michael was already in front of him, the tip of a long sword right in front of his face, inching closer mercilessly. Fenrir's eyes widened and his instincts kicked in. He tried to evade the sudden attack, but he was too late. His hands moved upward to block the attack, only to realize that the silver spear was still resting on the ground where he had set aside to have food and that he was only holding two wooden sticks. Gritting his teeth, Fenrir tried to launch a counterattack as a dark purple hue burst from his hands, enveloping the wooden sticks. Even if it was not possible to properly block the attack, his physical strength and instincts ought to be much stronger than Michael's. His refinement degree was much higher than Michael's, after all. It should be possible to change the trajectory of the fast-approaching blade. However, the moment Tigerfang's tip pierced the dark purple hue, Fenrir's expression distorted into an ugly grimace. How can he be so strong? He cursed in his mind. What Fenrir didn't know was that Tigerfang was an epic artifact, enhancing Michael's strength and perception drastically. But even without the enhancement, the blade's sharpness was enough to easily cut through the thin layer of dark purple hue and sticks without slowing down. At that moment, Tigerfang's tip sunk deep into Fenrir's throat. Splash! Fenrir's eyes widened in shock. Earlier, Michael didn't smile vibrantly, but plastered a fake smile on his face because he had to. Fenrir had indeed been using the wicked spear arts of the Calamity, and Michael was simply waiting for the right opportunity to strike. He was the Calamity or would have become one soon. Twisting the blade tip in Fenrir's throat, Michael bit down on his trembling lips hard, making them bleed while his shaking arm pushed the blade deeper into his opponent. Meanwhile, as the life in Fenrir's eyes dispersed slowly, a single thought flashed through his mind over and over again. Why? Chapter 17 Fenrir Inside a small basement of an apartment 510 years ago. Emergency news. Emergency news. Everyone listening to this podcast pay attention to what I am going to say next. The universe has finally gone crazy. Thousands of youths vanished last night, and more than a dozen pictures denote the existence of white gates that have been found at the crime scene. Nobody knows what exactly these gates are, or who created them but I have spoken to a few witnesses during the last few days. According to the witnesses, the White Gate sucked a member of their family, or one of their friends, inside, after a sphere-shaped mole formed on the back of their right hand. We don't know what exactly happens, and most might not believe me, but be careful when something manifests on the back of your right hand. It might change your life. The shrill voice of a famous podcaster rang out from the small speaker placed on a wooden table in a small room. The table shook and the walls in the small room trembled, as well as something heavy smashed on the wooden table, breaking it into two. Several men began screaming in shock, drowning the podcast's voice by far and large. The shouting men were loud enough to silence the pleading youth. The government is trying to hide this news, saying that they want to prevent mass panic, but I don't believe that. Ah, and the government started the colonization project outside the solar system. But who cares about something like that when magic doors open all over the sun system, kidnapping people by sucking them inside? The sound of a blunt bat smashing down on something soft could be heard clearly, followed by a pained scream. Stop! Please, stop, Dad! 
a weak scream and a plea for mercy escaped the lips of a young man. The young man, who was on the cusp of reaching adulthood, lay on top of the table that had been smashed into pieces with his body. His breathing was ragged, and even moving seemed like an enormous task. Every inch of his body hurt because he had been lifted and swung down mercilessly. Even if the young man knew that his father turned into a monster when he drank too much, today was different. The young man was accustomed to routinely getting hit, but his father had never lifted his body to smash him on the table, forget about using a bat before. Something had changed. The abyss-like eyes of the young man stared at the towering figure of his father, and insanity was the only thing he could see in those eyes. His father finally snapped. Why? Why is that happening to me? Why me? Why, why? You should hate your father a little more. He was stupid enough to get drunk and ask money from our men just to lose it all in gambling. This idiot is an utter failure, which is your misfortune. After all, you will have to sort out the mess he created. An unfamiliar voice reached the young man's ear. A middle-aged man with long red hair and heterochromatic eyes appeared in the doorframe of the smelly and moldy room. He was wearing a neat suit and smoking a cigarette while calmly watching the father beat up his one and only son with a glint of excitement in his eyes. Why are you coming after me? My father can pay for his own shit because I am not going to do it. The young man screamed in his head while feeling that the last strings of hope were viciously cut. In his mind, he got up from the ground and started fighting both the middle-aged man and his father. Unfortunately, it was all in his mind, nothing more. He didn't get up because he was too weak. Even if he had some strength left in his legs, the young man knew that he would never be able to beat his father. You don't know me, but that doesn't really matter, kiddo. Your father just sold you, your body to be precise, to pay up for his debt. I told your lovely father to beat you up a little bit and kill you to make sure that there is no sense of attachment between you and your father. Not that I cannot already tell that right now, the middle-aged man added with a vile smirk that stretched in a devilish grin. But I L, Ike to watch the desperation in the eyes of the victim when their own family stabs them in the back. In your last moments, you will be filled with pain, anger, regret, and the overwhelming feeling of injustice. But you won't be able to do anything. Isn't that exciting? The young man stared blankly at the middle-aged man standing in the doorframe, his eyes nearly popping out of his eye sockets. What? It was then that a lethal attack came his way. Swoosh! The bat smashed down on the young man's head. He could barely twist his neck to move his head a little, evading the impact by a hair's breadth. His father was utterly wasted, but he was a beast of a man, with a weight of more than 150 kilograms and a height of more than two meters. The impact of the blunt bat crushed the remains of the wooden table beneath the young man, throwing wood splinters everywhere. It was at that moment when the young man knew his father was out for his life. Dad, stop it. You can still stop. It's not too late yet. The young man screamed out as loud as he could, pleading his father to show some mercy. Kid, just give up. Your death has already been sealed. You are nothing more than a host for our precious exclusive items now. The middle-aged man said calmly, but the young man wasn't having it. Fuck off, you piece of shit he screamed, only to realize that he had been distracted for too long. The wooden bat crashed down on his stomach, taking his breath away. Stars swam in front of the young man's eyes for a second or two, only to regain his senses when he was lifted high in the air. His father's black eyes stared mercilessly at his son, as he pulled back the wooden bat once again. Will I really die here? The young man wondered, chaos and terror rioting in his head. Hurry up and kill him. I don't have all day to spare, the middle-aged man said impatiently. He saw what he came for and lost interest in the father-son duo quickly. When the monster of a father heard the middle-aged man's words, he threw his son against the closest wall. The sound of cracking bones rang in the young man's ears, but there was little to nothing he could do right now. He could only see his father approaching him slowly, holding the wooden bat in a vice-like grip. No. That was the life of Cleve Fenrir moments before he was sucked inside the Origin Expanse. It was a catalyst in the creation of a true monster that everybody would loathe and fear. 
I don't want to die. Today was his 18th birthday. It was a day of celebration, something he ought to be happy about. However, today was certainly not a day that could be celebrated. The only present he was about to receive was his own death, freedom from the shackles of life. If I was only a little stronger, he thought in his last moments, had a little bit more strength, I would have fought against them. I would have never allowed father to hit mom, to hit me, or my sister. While bitter thoughts clouded his mind, the back of his right hand began to itch. A small, sphere-shaped rune formed on the back of his right hand. It was smaller than a marble and could easily be mistaken for a uniquely shaped mole. I wonder how they would fare after mercilessly abandoning me. Soon after, space cracked open and a radiant light illuminated the room. The crack expanded in size until it was large enough to let a person through. Everyone stared blankly at the gate, their bodies frozen in place. I hope these whores soon die as well, he thought while looking at his father and the evil-looking man. A moment later, the Cleve Fenrir was pulled into the white gate. Cleve Fenrir disappeared, escaping his father's grasp and the hands of the unknown man. It was the same day these men would learn to regret to have hit him, to have forced him to become what he was. They should have killed Cleve Fenrir before it was too late. Chapter 18 Trust In a dense rainforest inside the Origin Expanse Present Day The last member of the Fenrir family stared deep into the dark, abyss-like eyes of the youngest child of the Fangs. A thin longsword separated them. Tiger Fang's tip burrowed deep into Fenrir's throat, and crimson-red blood gushed out of the wound. Fenrir's eyes were wide open and overflowing with shock and confusion. The life in his eyes slowly dispersed, but his hands were still moving. His hands tightly grasped the blade that had pierced his throat, trying to pull it out. However, Tiger Fang did not budge and continued to cut deep into Fenrir's palms. Michael's eyes quivered and his breathing grew loud and ragged. He was overflowing with rage that made his hands holding Tiger Fang tightly tremble, and he subconsciously bit down on his lower lip hard, resulting in blood trickling down his mouth. Fenrir's lips parted a little, but no word came out of his mouth. He couldn't speak anymore. His hands grew heavier by the second, and he didn't have enough strength to fight back anymore. The moment he let go of the blade, his arms fell limply to his side. Michael's eyes were still locked with Fenrir's dark eyes. He witnessed up close how the life in Fenrir's eyes disappeared, and how the heroic summon's energy slowly left his body. And it was growing increasingly difficult for Michael to keep holding Tiger Fang as Fenrir's entire body weighed down on Tiger Fang. Michael tried to pull it out, but the sensation of cutting through his first ancestor's neck caused him to retch. His entire body felt eerily cold, and his mind was overflowing with guilt and remorse. I did the right thing. So why am I feeling like this? Michael asked himself desperately. He knew that Fenrir had to be killed. It was the only way to make sure that his territory wouldn't be doomed. It wouldn't even end with the destruction of his territory the moment Fenrir would recover the power he amassed in the past. He would stop at nothing to lay waste throughout the origin expanse. Fenrir had to die. But then why did Michael feel like this? Cutting through Fenrir's throat was disgusting. Michael felt nausea from the sensation, and he was disgusted by himself. Not only had he attacked Fenrir, but it was a dirty attack, an assassination precisely planned to strike Fenrir when he was tired, hungry, and unarmed. Fenrir hadn't even been on guard against Michael when he manifested Tiger Fang. Only when Tiger Fang's fangs were bared and about to dig into Fenrir's throat did he react. Of course, it was already too late by then. Michael fell into a state of shock as he staggered back a little. The realization that the first time he killed another human was sinking in. In fact, it was the first time he had killed any living being. The Immactils in the final exam didn't count. Michael knew that they were illusions, so he didn't pay much attention to them. However, the slowly dying summon in front of him right now was different. The last remnants of life inside Fenrir dispersed, and he collapsed on the ground where his body writhed a few times before it came to a halt. Meanwhile, blood trickled down Tiger Fang's blade before it fell to the ground. A moment later, Tiger Fang turned into a white wisp that returned inside the war rune. Michael clutched his chest, and he began to vomit. His legs caved in, 
and he slumped to the ground, where he continued to empty out his stomach for the next 20 minutes. At the same time, Tiara stared at the turn of events with a deathly pale face as shock spread through her entire being. What? She mumbled, unable to move. Her lord just killed his one and only heroic summon, who was also one of his two subjects. Michael had only two subjects, and he had just killed one of them. Did he plan to kill her as well? No, that shouldn't be the case. Michael was a bubbly and kind lord. He didn't feel satisfied or relieved after killing Fenrir either. Otherwise, he wouldn't be on the ground, emptying his stomach while trembling like a leaf in the wind. It took Tiara quite a while to regain her senses. She had been staring blankly at the heroic summon's dead body and her vomiting master. Something felt odd, but Tiara wasn't able to make sense of the lack of clues at her disposal. She approached Michael carefully, bent down next to him, and slowly rubbed his back. The link of loyalty and her gut feeling told her that Michael was not a bad person. She had a bad feeling about Fenrir, but the exact opposite reaction toward Michael. Thus, rather than avoiding Michael, she felt like helping him. It was only a matter of time before she would uncover the truth of what had just happened. Why? Michael asked weakly when his stomach had been emptied, but Tiara couldn't quite understand. Why aren't you asking anything? Tiara continued to rub his back without saying anything for a while. Her gaze kept nervously flicking from Fenrir's unmoving body to Michael. There was something about them that made her senses tingle, but she was not quite sure what it was. I am your servant, your personal maid, not your supervisor whom you have to report to, Tiara said while trying to stay as calm as possible before she added, I think you will tell me why you did that if you want to. If not, it's fine as well. My job is not to question my master's decision, but to support them, even if they're wrong. Michael looked up and met Tiara's eyes. She was clearly forcing herself to stay calm and smile at him, and he was more than grateful for that, as that was exactly what he needed right now. It would have been worse if someone was to ask him hundreds of questions right now. He was not even sure what was going on inside his head, so how would he be able to explain everything to Tiara right now? After he saw Tiara's reaction, Michael finally calmed down. He couldn't look at Fenrir's corpse right now as he was struggling to gather his thoughts. This, Michael began, trying to tell Tiara what had happened. However, his mouth fell shut a moment later as the memories of Tiger Fang piercing Fenrir's throat resurfaced in his mind. He retched again, just a moment later, but there was nothing left in his stomach to vomit. I will clean up the mess and prepare a light meal for you. You might not want to eat something right now, but you will fall sick if you don't eat anything, Tiara said before she got up. Cleaning up the mess didn't take that long. She dragged Fenrir's corpse and placed it next to the gem jaguar corpses. After that was done, she retrieved the silver spear and used a wooden shovel which was another of Michael's creations from this morning, to clean the rest. Only when everything was cleaned up a little did she return to Michael, who was sitting on the ground in front of the campfire. Her master seemed like a lost soul, but the firmness in his eyes had returned. Was that the first time you killed someone? She asked, knowing that it was out of place to ask this as a servant, but Michael didn't mind. He just nodded his head and continued to stare into the flames. Tiara grilled a small chunk of meat and handed it over to Michael. He was not hungry, but he forced himself to eat, nonetheless. Half an hour later, he was done, and he began to speak, revealing everything he had found out so far to Tiara. Within less than ten minutes, Tiara's expression changed over a dozen times. At first, she didn't think that Michael's words made sense. However, when he showed her the mark behind his ear, Tiara's doubts dispersed. The mark behind his right ear was distinct, and it didn't take more than ten seconds for her to get up, move to Fenrir, and find the same mark behind his right ear. So, Fenrir is the first ancestor of your family and one of the first humans who entered the origin expanse five centuries ago. He was labeled the Calamity in this tome your family inherited, and you figured that Fenrir was the Calamity this morning when you had a dream about the past in which the images of the Calamity and Fenrir overlapped. Tiara summarized in a heavy tone. 
It sounded bizarre and like some tales, pewed by a drunkard on an evening when he had finished a few bottles of beer. Nonetheless, Tiara believed what he said. Michael's body language and the way he spoke were clear indicators that he wasn't lying. Massacring the Golden Takan, the Imperian Dragonia, and being a well-known slave merchant across the entire continent, to think that the Origin Expanse would summon someone like this as a heroic summon, the will of the Origin Expanse must have a few loose screws. She mumbled upon recalling the things Fenrir had done in the past. Michael had also told her that Fenrir practiced the same wicked spear arts as mentioned in the book. When she heard what the wicked spear arts did to someone, she smiled at Michael. You did the right thing by killing him, Tiara said with conviction in her voice. Fenrir was already close to the mid-refinement levels of Tier Zero. If not for him being unguarded and exhausted, maybe not even your surprise attack, or the fact that your artifact is extremely sharp, with a strong enhancement effect at the tip, would have been enough to kill him. Listening to Tiara didn't give him new intel. Michael was fully aware that he would have died if not for the factors Tiara pointed out. However, it didn't matter in the end. Michael was the one who emerged victorious, while Fenrir was the one who died. Whether it was a coincidence or not, his heroic summon had been a piece of shit, and only the Fangs were aware of that. Michael was not sure what happened, but the name Cleve Fenrir or Cleve Fang, which was the name used in the tattered book, had been removed from the annals of history. Did that mean Michael had been lucky? Was the Origin Expanse after the Fangs, or did the will of the Origin Expanse try to resurrect the Calamity to cause death and destruction across the Origin Expanse once again? Michael was not too sure about that. However, he could tell that his current situation was fucked up. He had lost his powerhouse and the strongest force in the territory, and the protection barrier would disappear in a little bit over and above the period of eight days. It would be great if he was able to summon another hero, but were they easy to summon? Heroes didn't grow on trees. Michael was at a loss for quite a while, and he could only feel the severed link of loyalty and the energy influx from killing a low tierless heroic summon. After giving it some thought, Michael gathered his courage and approached Fenrir's corpse. It was time to make use of his soul trait and reap as much as possible. And with that thought, he held his hand up above the corpse of Fenrir, and his hands began to glow golden a few moments later. Chapter 19. Second Soul Trait The energy influx Michael received from killing Fenrir increased his refinement degree. His war rune also increased slightly in size, and he officially became a low-tier zero lord on his second day inside the Origin Expanse. He had already accumulated quite a bit of energy from the 29 low-tier one monsters Fenrir had hunted. Michael should be happy that his strength increased and that the war rune's storage space expanded. However, his expression was grave. He could only stare down at Fenrir's corpse, feeling nauseous at the sight. Get your act together. You knew that this was bound to happen the moment you found out about his identity. If you wouldn't have killed him, Fenrir would have ended you eventually. Michael mentally chided himself. He squatted down at last and activated his soul trait. His hands were already glowing in a faint golden light, but the luminescence intensified later. The energy inside Michael was drained rapidly as he targeted Fenrir's corpse with extraction. Sweat beads trickled down his temples and Michael's breathing grew unstable in the next few seconds. Nonetheless, Michael fought the urge to stop exerting his soul trait. He continued using extraction until the last bit of energy inside his body was used up. Please give me something good, he pleaded with little hope. Even though he had killed the parasite inside his territory, Michael had also lost his entire combat force. It was not an exaggeration to say that he had to start again from scratch. Who would hunt Tier 1 monsters now that Fenrir was dead? Michael had to do it alone or ask Tiara to help him. He was not sure if Tiara had ever been trained in martial arts or faced with the dangers of life and death combat, but she was a Tier 1 maid. Her physical strength was incomparably higher than his. Huh? What is that? Tiara suddenly asked. Michael looked at her, just to see that she was pointing at the drops that had manifested next to Fenrir's body. Michael had extracted the items, but he had yet to pay any attention to them. 
Using his soul trait was already taxing enough and required his complete concentration. Separating his attention to do other things alongside the exertion of his soul trait was not possible for him, at least not yet. Oh? Upon looking at Fenrir's drops, Michael was a little astonished. Several items had dropped after he used extraction, but Michael was only familiar with the summoning scroll. However, it was a specific summoning scroll because it had the occupation tracker labeled on it. A warrior would have been better, but I guess a tracker isn't too bad either, he thought. Trackers were pretty good at scouting the surrounding landscape. They were better than scouts and could track the lair of monsters using the smallest clues and spotting them at places nobody would even think of looking. All in all, trackers were useful as long as you could use them well. It was only a slight bummer that a tracker summoning scroll manifested from the corpse of a heroic summon. Whatever, Michael told himself, thinking that the other drops were much better. Other than the tracker summoning scroll, Fenrir's body rewarded three more types of items. The first was a fist-sized wisp. Michael was not sure what exactly he had extracted from Fenrir, but he knew that he would find out soon enough. The next unknown item were a bunch of small transparent marbles, seven of them. Purple streams of energy swirled inside the hollow marbles, attracting his attention. He wanted to crush them to find out what would happen to the strands of energy, Medesa, but he held back sensing that the war rune was reacting to them. The war rune began to itch, and it began to glow much brighter than before. Is that energy to strengthen the war rune? Michael wondered, subconsciously moving one of the marbles closer to the war rune. In response, a tentacle-like white strand shot out of the war rune. The strand coiled around the marble before pulling back, disappearing with the marble inside the war rune. What the? He slough blurted out, closing his eyes just a second later. To understand what just happened, he focused on entering the deepest part of his consciousness. After doing that, Michael was able to see the white light in the center, surrounded by the wisp of tiger fang and the extraction emblem. Nothing changed? Michael wondered. He clearly felt that something inside him changed after the white strand pulled the marble inside the war rune, but it looked like there was no change in the war rune. No, wait! Upon paying more attention to Tiger Fang and the extraction emblem, Michael could make out a difference. It was an insignificant change, but something had changed about his soul trait. The stigma of extraction had only two stars before. However, now that he looked at it more in detail, Michael realized that faint outlines of a third star were beginning to form. These marbles increase my soul trait star rating? Michael nearly shouted aloud. Goosebumps sprang up all over his body, and the things that happened in the next few seconds seemed like a dream. He picked up the remaining marbles with the unknown purple energy streams and allowed the white strand of the war rune to take them all. Meanwhile, Michael never left the deepest part of his consciousness and continued to witness everything firsthand. A third star is actually forming. He realized in shock upon seeing that the purple strands of energy shot inside the stigma of extraction the moment they were released. The marbles he extracted from Fenrir's body were not enough to form a complete third star, but a third star was on its way. I am not dreaming, right? Michael wanted to figure out the reason why these purple marbles dropped to make sure that he could mass extract them in the future when the tentacle-like white strand of the war rune shot out once again. It moved faster than Michael could think and tightly grasped the third unknown item that had dropped after Fenrir's body had been fully extracted. It was a small coin-sized emblem with an eagle's eye. Two purple stars were beautifully carved on the top of the emblem. The moment the white strand touched the stigma, it began to glow vibrantly. At the same time, the white light in the deepest part of his being began to shine brighter as well. They reacted to one another. Slowly, a new symbol formed inside the bright light of the war rune. It showed the same emblem of the eagle eyes he had seen on the item that dropped from Fenrir. Wait a moment, he thought slowly realizing what was going on when he was surprised by a flood of information swamping his mind. This has to be a dream, he mumbled when he comprehended what had just happened. He had just extracted another being's soul trait and made it his own. Chapter 20 Memories 
When Fenrir was still a lord, he had the eight-star soul trait Divine Eyes, Michael recalled. Does that mean Divine Eyes turned into the two-star soul trait, Eagle Eyes? The flood of information that swamped his mind when Eagle Eyes manifested had already been digested. He knew how to use his new soul trait and the special benefits of Eagle Eyes. Eagle Eyes was a two-star soul trait that passively enhanced his eyesight. It could be used actively as well to further amplify his eyesight. It was strong if used wisely. If I could extract Eagle Eyes from Fenrir, does that mean I can use extraction to extract the soul traits of other beings as well? Michael wondered, but he quickly shook his head. Summoned subjects shouldn't possess their former soul trait anymore. Was I just lucky then? Countless thoughts flashed in his mind, and most of them were bound to remain unanswered. Fact is that I can extract soul traits and soul trait fragments, or marbles, or whatever they're called. It looks like I can upgrade extraction and eagle eyes if I collect more soul trait fragments, and it shouldn't be impossible to collect more soul traits as well. That's insane. The most important question was not how to collect more soul trait fragments, but to find out the details related to the drop rates of soul traits and soul trait fragments. What kind of beings would drop soul trait fragments upon being extracted, and why? The most logical answer to this was extracting the corpses of lords and adventurers. They possessed soul traits, after all. Shouldn't he be able to extract their soul traits as well, then? Will it be that easy? It's not like a two-star soul trait is bad. Still, why was I only able to extract a two-star soul trait from Fenrir? He had divine eyes. Does the star rating deteriorate? Why? One question after another formed in his mind, and it looked like Michael would never be able to escape the cycle of questions and uncertain answers. Is it because extraction is only a two-star soul trait? Would it mean I will be able to only extract two-star soul traits? Hmm. Fortunately, Michael chose to put an end to the series of questions and uncertain answers right here. He would find out the truth eventually either way. The answers were waiting for him, and it was not as if he was in a rush to know everything. However, there was something that could be answered immediately. Did extraction grow stronger upon digesting the soul trait fragments? Michael was still a little tired from using extraction on Fenrir, but he went ahead and extracted the drops from the gem jaguar corpses, nonetheless. Only extracting the drops created by the will of the origin expanse wasn't as taxing as dissecting the entire body precisely using extraction. However, it was enough to tell just how strong extraction had grown. A wooden warehouse blueprint, an ordinary summoning scroll, and 14 summoning scroll fragments. Even if the first two drops were mostly luck, extraction had grown much stronger and more efficient. He mumbled before extracting the monster cores and gemstones as well. They're a little bit cleaner than before, and a tad bit brighter. Have they been purified through extraction, or are they just in a better condition than the other monster cores and gemstones? Michael's words reached Tiara's ears, but she could only stare blankly at her master. She could roughly guess what he was doing, but she didn't understand the concept behind his soul trait at all. Michael informed Tiara that his soul trait was called extraction. Even without him telling her, she would have found out eventually. Michael wasn't trying to hide his soul trait, and one would have to be ignorant, stupid, or just extremely dense to be unable to find out what Michael's soul trait was capable of. Spending half a day next to him was already more than enough to figure out everything even for a maid. However, she couldn't really process what had happened just now. Her war rune's reaction to the items Michael extracted from Fenrir was volatile. The reaction was extremely violent, T, and it nearly made her act subconsciously. Tiara's hand reached out to the emblem and the purple marbles, which Michael absorbed not long after. It was great to see that Michael could feel excited so soon after he had killed someone the first time, but Tiara couldn't feel the same. She was not sure what Michael had done, and this uncertainty ate her from the inside. Can I ask him what just happened? No, a maid is not supposed to ask questions. Tiara thought dejectedly, while looking at the last item that dropped from extracting Fenrir. Master, please don't forget to use this item. She spoke after a while to fill the awkward silence surrounding them both. Somehow, she didn't want Michael to forget that she was also there, 
and that she could help him. There was no need for him to carry all responsibility upon his shoulders. Michael looked at the white wisp for a moment before he turned his attention to Tiara. The look in her eyes attracted his attention. You can ask if you're curious about something, but let me ask some questions in return as well, he said with a faint smile on his lips. Michael had many questions about Tiara, which included why she was a Tier 1 adventurer who had turned into the Maid of a Lord. There had to be a reason why someone not native to the Origin Expanse had been chosen as his personal maid. Tiara was also much stronger than most personal maids of New Lords. Michael knew that they had many things to do now, that they had only eight days left in the Origin Expanse with the protection barrier around their territory. The number of subjects at his disposal was insignificant. If he ignored Tiara and the summoning scrolls, and the only information Michael had about the surrounding region was that the proximity was filled, filled with Tier 1 monsters. Other than that little piece of information, Michael didn't know a thing about the dense rainforest. Tiara locked eyes with Michael and bowed her head lightly in response. Your offer is very kind, but I am not allowed to speak about certain subjects. The questions you have in mind are probably related to those subjects, and I cannot answer them even if I were to sacrifice my status as your personal battle maid, master. Tiara kept looked down at the ground and did not raise her head again. Michael could only see her gloomy expression and her ears drooped limply before she regained her composure. She smiled apologetically and bowed once again. So the will restrains her. And what is that about battle maid? Well, she never looked like an ordinary maid before, but I expected her to be royalty of the Silver Fang Tiger Folk and not a battle maid. What even is a battle maid? The title suggested that Tiara was able to fight, but Michael felt that the title had more meaning and that he was just ignorant of the obvious truth staring at him. Most people say that the will of the origin expanse is illogical and random, that it does everything without reasoning, but is that really the case? Michael wondered, feeling deep down that the will had its own reasoning. It was just harder to comprehend. While he was still deep in thought wondering about various things, Michael's hand reached out for the white wisp. However, the moment he touched it, something unexpected happened. The wisp burst apart and turned into several white streams that shot toward his head. They entered his mind, filling his brain with countless pieces of information. No, it wasn't countless pieces of information. What Michael received were memories, snippets of Cleve Fenrir's past life. Michael's eyes rolled so far back in his head that one could only see the white, and blood gushed out of his nose like a waterfall as the memories forced their way into his mind. He collapsed on the ground, writhing in pain while trying to fight the flood of information. Tiara gasped in shock and rushed over to him instinctively. She reacted fast, but she couldn't help him even if she wanted to. Michael only stopped writhing in pain after five minutes, and it didn't take long before a curse esking aped his lips. I cannot get even a moment of peace, can I? Why did he feel like this? A particular memory was seared in his mind.